out there. In this case, when I started out, I think that I really believed in the beginning that these men had a pretty positive impact on the neighborhood and a pretty positive impact on each other. And I think that my intention in the beginning was to write the first few chapters of the book and have that serve as the main basis of the book, the book in which they're very, the chapters in which they're very supportive of one another and in which they're doing for one another things that are not being done by social programs which are absent and not provided by the government after they come out of prisons and jails. But as I spent more time out there and was confronted by a much bigger range of situations, I came to notice other kinds of behaviors like urinating in public, sleeping in public, um, binging on crack cocaine, and talking to women as they passed by on the street. There were all these various activities which were really uh, essential to understanding the life of the street and which I was not planning to take into account because I didn't know about them. But the more that I surveyed, the more that I saw, the more open I was and the less insulated I was from new data and new things hitting me in the head, the more likely I was to give a more complicated account. So that's really what I mean by trying to work with the principle of not insulating myself from data. A fifth principle that I try to work with is the principle of transparency, the principle of being public about my procedures. As an ethnographer, we have a bond with our readers and with the viewers of a film like the one that you saw. And that bond goes something like this. I am going to tell you how I have achieved these effects, how I have convinced you. And if I am not upfront and clear with you about how I have done so, then I am failing you. And in a sense, I'm being dishonest. Our bond depends upon your believing that you have a sense for how it is that I've gone about bringing about these effects. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about how I go about trying to be transparent. Well, first, I try to be clear about my own self, my own investigator effects, how it is that I've affected the situation under study, how it is that my presence has influenced being on the sidewalk and the lives of those people. I try to be clear about my social position, how my race or my class or my gender has affected or influenced the things that have gone on between me and the research subject. And I try to give a sense when my opinion is driving the analysis. In this case, one thing that you need to be aware of in order to have a more honest sense of the film is that at the times when Hakim is talking about some of the structural issues, and he's talking about the influence of drugs and the influence of the criminal justice system and a number of other factors in the lives of these men, he's doing so because I asked him to. I asked him to speak to those issues because every time we experimented with my going on the film as a talking head, we found that it distracted from the overall flow of the film in which the entire film was in the voices of the people themselves. Now these were issues that Hakim and I had talked about on many occasions and which Hakim was very well aware of, but they weren't things that happened spontaneously. It was a conversation that occurred because I told him that I wanted him to be on the film being the voice of these kinds of structural conditions so that the reader would go away with these conditions firmly planted in his mind. But it's very important that you know that these things came because I asked him to say them, not because he did them on his own initiative. They were not naturally in the film in that space. Secondly, a thing that I try to avoid in doing ethnographic work of this kind is what might be called cherry picking. Cherry picking occurs when we take snippets of interviews or conversations with people and we present a limited amount of the data and don't give a person a sense for the contradictions and the other things that somebody might have said that don't necessarily illustrate the point that we want to make. At the end of the film, there's a piece of footage in which I explain what happened, in which I'm trying to explain the various ways that people come off of the blocks and Ishmael explains that he went through a program. I want to play for you right now a piece of footage that shows you two ways in which the interview went when I conducted it. And I want to then show you how I made my selection and what you did not see in the film that you need to see in order to make a more qualified judgment about whether or not and what you want to believe.
So what was different this time when you came out of jail? Uh, when I came out of jail, I came out with something. I came out with a, a certificate of what I did. When I didn't go to jail just to sit on my ass or sleep in the bed all for the two and a half years, I went in and got in school and came out with a skill. That's the big difference. I didn't have that. Last time I went upstate, I, I, I laid around and do nothing. But this time, I can't, I knew that I had to come out here, and I knew that there was somebody out here waiting for me, so I wanted to come back out here with something and use it to my advantage, and which that it did help me, because if I didn't have a little skill on me now, I wouldn't be working right now. Was that program here the last time that when you came out? The CEO program? Yeah. Uh, I never heard about it. It was like, it was so quiet if it was, they, they said they'd been around, but my PO never told me about it. And, um, and, and, and they knew about it, you know, it just, it was like picking people to go and people, you know, not telling people. Some people went there and still got locked up behind, behind CEO, you know, it just felt like they didn't want to accept $30 a day, you know, I did. I took the $30 a day until I got myself here. Because that's how they helped me. They got me a better job. They wanted, I had to work with them at least for six months to prove myself that I was worthy to do for another job. CEO just, you know, every time, even if I would lose this job right now, I can go back to CEO because I'm going to always be on record. And they, I'm going to always be on record. And they always tell me, if you ever lose this job, to come back and we'll help you get another job and whatnot. You have to be on the job. You have to be on a job that they send you for at least a year, you know, and I just made my year. So I have to go back because they have to give me certain things out of there, like certain little rewards and, you know, certificates and stuff like that. You can see from that um, little bit of footage that there were two possible ways that this material could have been presented. And in the first interview that I did with Ishmael, he didn't really say anything about the program. Um, he talked about his getting into this job as being based on his own initiative, okay? How hard he worked, that he got off his ass, um, unlike other men in prison who didn't show the same initiative. And it was because I knew enough about his life um, and had spent enough time with him that I knew that he had been in a program. And so we did countless takes. This was just, I shouldn't say countless, but we did numerous takes. And this was just two of probably five or six in which I kept saying to Barry, Barry, I want to do another one, okay? And I kept on trying to get him to talk about the program. And these were leading questions that I was asking, right? Now, frequently, when you see these kinds of snip, uh, interview segments in works of ethnography or sociology, you don't see the questions that were asked. You don't see how the data was derived. And so you have a right to know this. Um, and it's one of the weaknesses of this method that um, ethnographers can engage in a form of cherry picking and put what they feel is best there without explaining themselves um, in more detail. In this case, why did I make the choice that I did? Well, I felt as though as a sociologist, I know the literature of sociology. I know the literature says that programs are important. I knew that Ishmael had gone through a program. I knew that other men on the block had already illustrated the fact that you can get out on your own. Um, you can make exits through your own initiative without programs at times. And I felt that the most realistic portrait was to include Ishmael talking about the program um, as a way of creating a sense of the full range of experience um, and realistic situations that people are in every day. But it's important that you know that, though. And that's why I consider this talk to be partly a methodological appendix to the film itself. Without you having this information, the film really cannot exist as a work of social science. So finally, the last principle that I want to talk about also has to, to do with a moral bond. But it's not the moral bond between the ethnographer and the reader or the viewer. It's the moral bond between the ethnographer and the research subject. And this has to do with the issue and the question of exploitation. These days, most research is governed in universities by IRBs, which if you do research for your thesis, you will find out. You will have to, if you do research with human subjects, you will frequently have to go before an IRB, an institutional review board, and present your research idea and get permission from them to um, have interaction with human subjects. And the main goal of the IRB 
is that you should not do any more harm to a subject than they would experience in their everyday life. But one of the things that the IRB spends very little time thinking about um, is the question of exploitation, the question of the ways in which researchers benefit at the expense of subjects, the ways in which researchers can appropriate subjects and use subjects and then go on with their lives in ways that can be disreputable and hurtful to the people involved. And I want to talk a little bit about that today in the context of the Sidewalk Project because I knew at various stages of the project, especially at the end when the book was going to be published, that I was going to make money on this book. And I had to confront that fact as I went about dealing with these men. And the question was, what do you do with the money? It's very clear to me that I benefit in a whole variety of ways from doing studies of this kind. I have a career as a sociologist. I stand up here as a professor. I have a life that, in some sense, has been built upon this kind of work. There's very little that I can do about that <coughs> overall. However, it's, it is something that I can take seriously and try to do something about in concrete situations. And so when the book was coming out, I met with the men and I asked them whether we could make an arrangement whereby we share the royalties that come to us from the book. And I said, look, nobody's going to get rich from this book. Um, it's not going to make a whole lot of money, but whatever money exists, I hope that we can find a way to, um, to share. Um, and people were open to this. It was already at a point where the book was done. Um, there was no way that, by the way, a concern to me would be that it would influence people's behavior, that they would do things to try to you know, make a best-selling book or something. But this was after the book was already out. And we came up with a process by which, when the royalty checks came, I would get in touch with each person. I, people would do their best to stay in touch with me, to let me know where they could be found and then the money would be split. So when the first royalty check came out after the book had been out for a year, uh, I went to the blocks and every person got about $200. And a lot of these guys really thought that they were going to make more money than that. And it wasn't that they were being completely unrealistic from their point of view, because so many people in the neighborhood had come up to them with the book, had gotten autographs, the book had been in the local bookstores in the windows with big oversized covers advertising it. And there was a sense, in, at least in the Greenwich Village neighborhood where they worked, that this was a big event and that this book was being purchased by a lot of people. And then it ended up getting used in local universities and students would come up to them asking them for autographs. And I think that when in the end each person got only $200, it just didn't seem like a whole lot of money. And so one of the things that was very hurtful to me was that some people didn't believe that I was actually giving them the, the money that I had gotten. And it was hurtful to me, but I also had to realize that just because I have goodwill um, and had nice relations with people doesn't mean that I can escape from a historical relationship in which people like me, um, people with this skin color and my background and my class background have historically <coughs> exploited people like those men. The fact of my goodwill does not help me escape very much from that historical relationship. And so I tried to deal with that situation with empathy and patience and understanding. And I tried to do my best to explain to the men how the, the numbers were derived and to bring royalty statements and to show them facts and, and um, documentation that would back up what was, um, what was the situation. And I don't mean to suggest that everybody challenged me or everybody accused me or anything of the sort. But it was clear to me that people were not pleased. In addition to that, I found that in the initial years that this um, royalty sharing was going on, and it goes on to this day, but in the initial years, people would, when I would come to the blocks, they would see me and suddenly what had been a really nice, or at least had felt like a nice, easy relationship had turned into something that was really about money. So people would say to me things like, uh, Mitch, yelling, yelling at me from across the street, Mitch, when I see you, I'll take mine in cash, okay? Um, when you come back in December, please give it to me in cash. And this is having people yell this to me across the street. It wasn't the nicest, most pleasant thing, especially when it was somebody who used to say to me, how are you? Um, or how are you doing today? So, but over time, um, we developed a method for distributing the money. And it, even to this day, the men get somewhere around about $100 a, a year. And people have, over time, really grown accustomed to and have come to really understand my situation. I think, think that there's developed a lot of empathy for me, and I think that a lot of the people, um, at least, I, I can't say what's in their heads. I can't say how they really feel, but I think that 
many of them feel as though I have made an effort. At least they act like they feel that way. And I feel as though, in retrospect, even though it was a very hard thing to do at times, it was probably ultimately the best way to handle the situation. The thought of being a researcher who, did, who wrote a book and then just walked away and went on with his life and made money and didn't try to share it with the people um, was not something that I don't think I would want to look back at this experience and think that I had handled it in that way either. I think what this illustrates is that there's no real great solution. I think that there's nothing that you can really do ultimately that's perfect. Um, frequently, we walk away with materials from people's lives as sociologists. We appropriate it in ways that they themselves can't recognize necessarily, that they don't see it the way they, don't see it the way they that we see it. They don't have sociological minds. Um, it's inevitable that in research of this kind that some people are going to feel as though they've been used, or some people are going to feel as though their lives have been abused, or that they've been taken advantage of. But our goal as ethnographers can't be to let that just sit there as a given. It can't be to just accept that and say, well, there's nothing that we can do about it. From my perspective in doing this kind of work, my goal is to anguish about it, to take it seriously, to think about it, and to at least allow it to become a driving force in my relationships with the people such that ultimately what we do in the field is about respect, respect for human subjects. I want to tell you one brief story about my meeting with Ron in Jamaica at the end of the film. Um, as you know, at the end, Ron gets deported and he's sent back to Jamaica for, for a drug offense. He was back in Kingston, um, actually in Spanish town. I wanted to show what had happened to him and track him down. And I found him living on the streets, um, once again, addicted to crack cocaine. And he was willing to be interviewed and to talk to the cameras about his experience. It was a very sad moment for me because Ron is somebody who I developed a very close relationship with on 6th Avenue. And to see him reach a point um, where he was living in that little shack with um, lizards running all around him at night and mosquitoes and the whole thing that he describes at the end, it was a really devastating sight to see. On my last day there in Kingston, um, he said to me, you know, Mitch, I remember when we were out on 6th Avenue the last time, and you and Ovi, Ovi is the Pulitzer Prize winning photographer that took all the magnificent pictures for the book. You and Ovi Carter asked me if you could take a picture of me smoking crack cocaine. And I told you no, and I was furious with you and Ovi for asking me that. And we had wanted a picture of him smoking crack because we thought that it belonged in the book to show and illustrate the problems that he had. And he said, I was really mad at you then, but now looking back on it, I can see that crack has been the thing that's ruined my life. And if that book ever gets published again, I would like to see that picture of me smoking crack in there so that other young people who read it can see that it was my downfall and maybe they'll know not to smoke crack. Well, Ovi wasn't with me on this trip and I went back to, um, I went back to, to New York and I called Ovi who lives in Chicago and I asked him whether or not he would want to get that picture still and he did. And we thought a lot about it from an ethical point of view and we thought if we go back to Kingston and we film Ron smoking crack and we take this picture of him and we just walk away from there and we let him continue living on the streets there the way we are, there's something very exploitative about that. There's some way in which this man is being used, even though he wants that picture taken. And so we decided that if we're going to do it, we have to take the ethical aspect of, and the exploitative aspect of the situation seriously and see if there's some way that we can help him in his life. So going back there, we talked to Ron about what he wanted and what we could do, if there was anything that we could do to help him in his life at this point. After we took the photograph, he told us that he wanted to become a taxi driver. You saw at the end of the film that he's loading people into taxi cabs, and he's basically getting money for putting people in, in cabs and loading them in. And he wanted to become one of the drivers himself. So I took him around to try to help him get a driver's license, and I discovered that he really didn't have the skills to drive. In Jamaica, they drive on the other side of the road. They're on the British system. The steering wheel is on the other side.